So Rita, just a, uh, a comment. Frank has asked the question of a concrete example of kind of um, early warnings model. Um, the, the example that we've put out here is that there's some point in the future, call it March of next year, that you have two alternative futures uh, and that you can prepare for, for. One of our favorite examples, which we've been talking about lately, is the petroleum industry, right? So I think that's a great example, Frank, of there's an industry where there's you're looking down a tunnel, there's a light, and you know the light's not the end of the tunnel, it's a train coming, right? And the world is gonna the world is gonna change. And if you are Exxon and you've seen what happened with Exxon over the last several months with, you know, um, now I think it's three uh, dissident board members uh, joining the board, um, or you're, uh, you know, you're in the petrochemical business and you're using petrochemicals to make your product, the world's going to change, pricing's going to change, um, the demand for your product is going to change. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating study because if you look at, um, I think oil's around $70 a barrel today, which is a, a two-year high. The short term is completely disconnected uh, with the long term. The long term is it's very very clear that something's going to happen. It's very clear if you have, you know, billions or hundreds of billions as Exxon Mobil has, or BP has, that you have to do something very serious to prepare for this change. Yeah, I would just add that um, the way I normally set it up, Frank, is um, we'll have a time zero event. And in the book, it goes into some depth about how you can generate those, uh, which is essentially you take two uncertainties um, that are real. This gives you a two by two <laughs> of, of four possible futures. And then you write a headline from each future that becomes your time zero event. And then what we recommend is work backward and say before time zero could happen, what would have to be true? Right. So let's say let's take our, our time zeros that we're playing around with today. So March of 2022, no problem. What would have to be true? Right. We'd have to see uh, increasing evidence that people are vaccinated or have somehow achieved some kind of immunity. We'd have to see that there aren't variants uh, that are increasingly contagious. Uh, we'd have to see that that, you know, good um, regimes in terms of keeping people safe, uh, continue to be adopted. We'd have to see, for example, that children are starting to be protected. Um, and, 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 right? For, for that to be true, there's a lot that would have to happen uh, before we believe in that scenario. And the same with the other scenario. In the other scenario, you know, would, unfortunately, what you'll see is more deadly variants. You'd see people who are unable to or unwilling to, or, you know, just can't get vaccinated for whatever reason, continue to be a large proportion of the population. You'll sort of see localized outbreaks, uh, especially among more vulnerable populations. And the thing about global health is if any of us are affected, all of us are at risk of being affected. So I think that's just really important to remember. So the, the worked model would be you have your time zero and then you work backward looking for indicators. And then a best practice, what we advise our clients is then you set up a little almost call it a council within your organization where everybody has a job. Everybody's looking after an indicator. So let's say uh, Flaminia is looking after the indicator of, you know, per, per local region, how many people what percentage of the people are actually vaccinated. And she would track that, right? And now if Ron or I or you come across um, uh, something that that is evidence around that, now we, had, now we know who to send it to, right? So we send it to Flaminia. Then we have our little meeting, maybe once every month, once every two months. And the purpose of the meeting is not to make decisions. The purpose of the meeting is to make sense of what's going on. So a very similar process to the one that Stan McChrystal used in his uh, fabulous book, Team of Teams, when he was trying to mount a response by a very hierarchical organization, the US military, uh, to a, an enemy that was changing its shape on the ground all the time. And what he found was they needed to create what he calls shared consciousness. And the same is true with these kinds of early warnings. It's not that the data aren't there. The data are always there. It's just they're locked in individual brains. They're spread out somewhere um, where we're not seeing them. So we're not seeing the strategic implications. So Frank just asked a, a follow-up and um, this is Rita's sweet spot. So I'll comment, then I'll turn it over to Rita. Um, <laughs> he's asking if Exxon and BP will have less freedom so long as they wait to make changes. And the answer to that is absolutely unequivocally that is true. So if you think about their business, um, they uh, pour concrete, they uh, build or uh, lease uh, these massive ships that are as big as small towns. 
these are assets that have 20, 30, 40 year um, life cycles. So they're spending capital today that they will be depleting over the next 20 to 30 years. So every decision they make today to influence the future locks them into uh, some kind of economic outcome. Another another fascinating area for me, and it's, a, it's one of the things that I discuss when I'm coaching CEOs and, and board members is um, this kind of um, asymmetry between uh, a CEO lifespan or board lifespan compensation and the future. So if you think about some of these industries, it's one of my favorite topics. Like I'm the CEO of big petroleum company, um, global petroleum company A, and um, I'm going to retire in five years. How do I think about radical change in my organization? And how do I think about preparing my organization for, for an event that is certain to happen in 20 or 30 or 40 years? And the certainty is you won't be selling gasoline to automobiles. So your demand will be down very, very significantly when my compensation is tied to now and in the next five years. It's a huge cultural problem. It's a big issue for for boards. Uh, Even board members can think the same way. I'm on the board. I'm going to be here three years. Because all I have to do is not do anything that gets me sued when I leave. And, you know, I'll I'll collect my uh, my stock uh, compensation. So the cultural aspect of these kind of transformations and the and the, the personal kind of motivations um, can be very disconnected from a really obvious future state. Rita and I are working with a petrochemical company now, and Rita, I'll let Rita tell the story about this engagement, but it's very, very typical of how some um, organizations operate. Rita, do you want to talk about it? Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> toward the end of, it would have been 2020, sort of, fall of 2020 um i get this frantic call we really 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 want to work with you you've got to come talk to our board you know we we want to transform we want to change we want to do all this and it was all like hurry up hurry up hurry up let's get the contract in place let's get this moving um so then frantic pace of meetings like you know hours of meetings every week getting ready for this board lots of research here's what we want to do meeting with the strategy committee meeting with the board advisors meeting i mean they, they were like my whole calendar for about three months there um, and so the big board meeting happens, let's say it was January and uh, we're, we're already right. Like, okay, we got, we got the go ahead, the green light, the board loved it. It was really mind blowing. And they loved the way we talked about their stock price. We loved the way they talked about, you know, their future communication strategy. This is all great. And so we're getting into January and well, there's a lot of work to do to follow up on the board. Okay. So now it gets to be kind of February and, you know, they're kind of looking around and hmm quarter's looking a little soft. And we've got this digital transformation thing that we're also trying to worry about. And, and I'm like, look, I'm here, you know, let, let me know. And so there's like two guys that, that I'm working with pretty closely and giving ideas and, you know, doing, doing various activities. But the main, the main attention of the leadership seems to have moved on. So February turns to March, March turns to <laughs> uh, April. And then I get this sort of sheepish call saying, well, we're not sure that we can really act on the things that we talked about because there's all this other stuff going on. So um, we're going to put it on pause. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's fine with me. Like it's your company, but, but all that progress we made, you just know is going to erode. Right. So the enthusiasm, the energy, the momentum is going to erode and then we're going to have to start it up again. And it's going to be back to, you know, back to back crisis meetings when the next thing happens. And what's going to happen, I suspect, is the board's going to start to ask pretty pointed questions about, you know, you were talking this great game in January. What, what you know, show us where, where it is. Um, and this is actually something Ron and I are working on a lot, which is how do we create consistency across the management of a portfolio? And it is one of the perennial frustrations when you go into a large, complicated company and you say to them something very innocuous, like, so, so what are you guys working on? <laughs> You know, once you dig into that question, what becomes pretty clear is nobody knows. And so one of the things we've been building, and and it's I've been doing it manually for years, but we're, we're working on this tool to kind of make it a little easier to figure out what's where at what stage, but more importantly, to capture information about it as it's developing. So you don't get this mythology about what actually happened in, in the company. And you've got some idea about who's working on what and 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 to what end. And it's not, not to try to impose layers of control. 
It's just to create a reality around what is it that we've actually learned? What is it we're actually doing? And um, we have, we're excited about it. I think it's, it's a, a, it could be a bit, a bit of a breakthrough. So I'm, I'm keen on it. Um, it. Was that sort of what you had in mind, Ron, for me to talk yeah, about? Yeah, it absolutely was. There's now a question here. It's like, can you apply this framework to product development and early stage entrepreneurship? And I, I think the answer is absolutely. I'm going to talk about product development, Rita, and I'll let you uh, talk about entrepreneurship. And we're all, what I'll talk about in product development is um, I actually just posted this morning the story of Minidisc and Sony and, you know, how you, know, that, you should probably tell them a little bit about yourself now that I'm thinking oh, yeah, about I probably it. Because I don't think I did a very good job introducing <laughs> you. <laughs> well, I, um, and thank you, Rita. I grew up at Sony, so I spent uh, probably about half of my career at Sony, um, you know, in various roles, um, but ultimately- well, you, were, you were there when it really grew, right? I mean, you were there- I was there, yeah. When I joined Sony, it was about a billion-dollar company. When I left, it was about a $30 billion company, um, which was uh, a fantastic ride. And it's still, a fan, uh, uh, still many, many, many of my closest friends are still Sony people in the Sony world. So it was a great ride, um, and um, um, I got to do a lot of things that um, if the company wasn't growing that fast, I probably wouldn't have got to do. And one of them was run the, the personal um, uh, mobile products company. So uh, back in the day, that was the Walkman company. Um, and a mini disc was one of the products. And I, I, you know, if you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see a little story on, on mini disc and, and kind of what happened there. But the question is, can you apply this framework to um, to um, product development. Um, so beyond beyond Sony, I then went out into retail. I was at Best Buy during one of their transformations, which is really exciting. And I've also done a lot of work in private equity uh, with a number of transformations in private equity and um, some very successful and some not so successful because that's how the world goes. Um, I wanna talk about from a product development standpoint, um, you know, there are a couple of really interesting ways to think about this. So when, when I first got into product uh, on, the, on the Sony side, the compact disc was still a really big thing, right? And uh, it was going to be eventually replaced by pure digital audio. And it was very, very clear to the music industry, it was very, very clear to Sony that this was going to happen. But the question becomes, how do you prepare for that? And how do you, how do you truly think through that? Um, the mini disc article touches on some of these things. So if you, those of you who are older than Flaminia, God bless you, Flaminia, probably <laughs> never owned a CD player. Um, understand, <laughs> understand that, that the, the, the digitization of audio was a terrifying thing for the music industry because it meant you could now, once it's ones and zeros, it's quite easy to, to, to photocopy a, a CD. Um, so the industry spent a lot of time trying to constrain the, the, the free movement of music while the uh, electronics industry wanted to sell devices that could you know, copy and replicate uh, music. And it was very, very clear to see that there was a point at which where broadband was gonna get fast enough, the internet was gonna get fast enough, that truly downloading and streaming music was going to happen, but it wasn't clear as when that point was or what the business model was. Um, so the, throughout the 90s, there was a huge number of failed attempts to control music. One was um, called the Secure Digital Music Initiative. If you ever want to have your head explode, go to Wikipedia and read about that one. I lived through that for about five years, um, which essentially was an industry trying to put a digital wrapper around everything in the world. And of course, that never worked. And ultimately, the people who solved this problem were not in the music industry and were, in fact, not in the portable music device industry. And it was a little fruit company called Apple that came up with this thing called an iPod and, um, and, and, and Apple Music. And they were able to do it because they, in, in, from my perspective, they were free of the constraints of thought and free of the constraints of, of the conflicts within uh, the music and electronics industry. If you think about Sony, Sony actually owned both pieces. They owned the biggest record company in the world and the biggest electronics company in the world. And we could not talk to each other. I actually participated, actually proposed a product called Music Station in Japan, which almost got me fired, um, that said we can combine these things and make digital recordings and sell them. And I proposed that in 1999. And you guys know that the iPod wasn't even introduced until four or five years later. So we were ahead, but we couldn't execute because we culturally could not get out of our own way 
Uh, and frankly, the idea was probably a little bit too uh, early. Um, but you absolutely unequivocally, it was obvious to everyone in the industry that this was coming. What was not obvious was, and was not really well thought out in my opinion, was all the optionality. And Rita can talk about platforms and stepping stones as um, and, uh, something that she's written a lot about, that those platforms and stepping stones were not developed and were not worked. And therefore somebody on the outside just did it. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's an amazing story. I remember um, there was an article that came out and I wanna say it was as long ago as 1984. Um, and it was talking, the title of the article was The Civil War Inside Sony. And yep. the article made the point that, you know, you had the hardware people and they wanted all the st content to be free. You had the content people and they wanted the hardware to be free. <laughs> you know? and, then you had, and then you sort of had the distribution people who didn't care what happened as long as they got their act together and you had something to sell. And nobody talked to each other. So absolutely, absolutely um, um, uh, difficult. Um, so let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship, because I think, um, it, it, yes, you can definitely apply this model to entrepreneurship. With, with true entrepreneurship, what I mean by that is when you're creating a new category. So I'm not talking about opening up like a franchise dry cleaning business, which is also entrepreneurship. I'm not denigrating it, but I'm saying if you're truly creating a new kind of category. And the case I'll use here is the case of Jim McKelvey, who's been, been a fireside guest. And he was one of the co-founders of the product that later became Square. And, um, and basically it's, you know, making, an, making a phone a credit card. And the reason he thought about this product, and it was not his first business, he was, he's actually a glassblower. He's a very highly skilled and highly trained glassblower. And he was in the process of packing up his studio in one part of the country to move it to another. And there was this huge, really ugly piece of glass that he, he didn't know what to do. You know, he didn't really like it. And he finally found a buyer for it. And he was just thrilled. But it turns out this buyer, uh, was a woman who wanted to pay for this thing on her American Express card. And he couldn't accept American Express cards. You know, he was a very small business at the time. And, you know, tiny little businesses can't afford interchange fees. They can't afford the overhead of what it takes to be accredited as a vendor. And, and you know, Amex is expensive. I mean, <laughs> for years, they the, many people didn't carry them because they were so expensive to wear. So he lost the sale. And this sparked in him a passion to figure out why couldn't we make a credit card product that would work for people like him that would work for small vendors. And in, in his, he's got a wonderful book called The Innovation Stack, which I can highly recommend to any of you that are interested in um, uh, innovation. I can also recommend watching our fireside chat, which you'll find on YouTube. Um, he he's just tells the story in a wonderful way. But what he talks about is that any existing regime bumps up against a wall. And if you think about it as venturing out into unknown territory, there comes a point where what's known comes to an end. And it comes to an end, I would argue, this is my language, not his, but it comes to an end because there's some breakthrough, there's some barrier, there's some inflection point that has not yet happened. And what these true entrepreneurs do is they really think about what would it take to break through that? Like, what is the inflection point I would have to create or leverage to break through that? And McKelvey talks about all the things they had to do to turn the phone into a credit card. And there's a whole chapter on how you how you get regulated as a credit card provider. And then there's the technology, right? Because those of you that know the square reader, it's a tiny little square that you plug into the, the part of your phone that used to have the headphones in it, which doesn't anymore. But, and I guess now they plug it into wherever the charging thing is. But, um, you know, they had to make this really thin, really attractive looking device. They had to um, solve all these problems. And so what I think how the model applies in entrepreneurship is, You've got your time zero, which is this thing's in everybody's hands. And I, and you know, and my, my brother who does plumbing can accept credit card payments. Uh, that's the vision, that's the time zero. But what we have to do is break through all these barriers to do it. And in the book, McKelvey talks about how Amazon literally tried to take them out. They had a, a I think it was called neighborhood, something like that. I forget what the Amazon reader was, but you know, he said he, he would go to bed at night, like sweating bullets because my God, one of the best financed, most aggressive, best run companies on the planet is coming after your little startup. And he said, we talked about it. We spoke about it. We, we, we went back and forth and back and forth as a leadership team trying to figure out what are we going to do? And then we decided to do absolutely nothing differently because we had solved all these problems that Amazon didn't even know existed yet. And eventually, after about, I think it took about a year, but after about a year, Amazon folded. 
they just said, we, we, we can't compete with this startup that's so laser focused on solving this series of problems. And in what I thought was a, quite a nice gesture to the customers, when Amazon decided to pull out of this business, they bought Square Readers for all of their customers, sent them, sent the Square Readers in a beautiful little box with a note saying, we think you'll be better serviced by working with Square. And, you know, fascinating story. But again, you've solved these problems in ways that are not copyable by somebody who hasn't had that experience. And so that's how I would relate it to this sort of category creating flavor of entrepreneurship.